Throughout the 1930s and 1940s, Albert Einstein was plagued with abdominal pain, which was a complete mystery even to himself. He didn't know what was going on. It was so severe, it even caused him to vomit. Finally, in the autumn of 1948, he'd had enough. The abdominal pain was so severe, he decided to go seek the counsel of his friend, Dr. Rudolf Nissen. Yes, that's the same Dr. Rudolf Nissen that was a pioneering surgeon behind Nissen's fund application, the surgery that cures acid reflux. Albert Einstein had a pretty long and convoluted medical history even before this. At the age of 38, before he published his major works on the theory of relativity, he lost 25 kilos in weight and was severely jaundiced. He was diagnosed with liver cirrhosis, which is usually a result of excess alcohol consumption. But since Albert Einstein didn't really consume alcohol, it was thought it was because of infectious hepatitis, an infection of the liver. And at the age of 49, while still living in Berlin, he experienced a sudden collapse and was diagnosed with inflammation of the heart and ordered strict bed rest for four months. And coming back to 1948, after a physical examination by Dr. Rudolf Nissen, a large pulsating mass was noted in the middle of his abdomen. That's not a good sign, let me tell you. Nissen suggested exploratory surgery. A laparotomy, a major cut down the middle of Einstein's abdomen to see what's going on on the inside. And what Nissen discovered was a large grapefruit-sized abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now, what exactly is an aortic aneurysm? Well, your aorta is the largest blood vessel in the body and runs through the middle of your abdomen. It's called the abdominal aorta, and usually it runs pretty straight. Now, when you have an aneurysm, it looks more like a snake that swallowed a balloon. And just like a balloon, the balloon can keep expanding until it pops, and that's called an aortic rupture. An aortic rupture is a true medical emergency which has a 100% death rate if it's not treated. Now, unfortunately, during that era, surgical management options were very limited. Ligation of the abdominal aorta where you basically tie it off was proven to be ineffective. So the only viable option remaining was to reinforce the weakened wall and essentially delay the inevitable rupture. So what exactly did Nissen do to prevent the balloon inside Einstein from popping? Well, he used cellophane or cling film. Yep, cling film. The same cling film you use in your kitchen to wrap up leftovers was used to save the life of the smartest man in the world. What doctors like Nissen understood was that cling film was more than just a constrictive wrapper. When placed inside the body, it triggered something known as a foreign body reaction. Essentially, your body realizes that cling film is a foreign invader and doesn't belong in the body, so sends immune cells to attack this perceived invader. And the immune system doesn't just attack the cling film, but also the weakened, diseased aorta underneath and triggers scarring, fibrosis, which ultimately leads to constriction and narrowing and ultimately reinforcement of the diseased, weakened vessel. A simple yet effective solution to a deadly problem. You might be wondering how Einstein aneurysm would be diagnosed and treated today. Well, we have a plethora of options. To detect an aneurysm, we have ultrasounds, CT scans, MRI scans, which are accurate, detailed, and provide all the information we need before we plan any procedure. Today, any patient without any serious medical problems that has an abdominal aortic aneurysm greater than five centimeters would be an ideal candidate for surgery. Now, Einstein would most certainly have been referred for major surgery because at the time of his symptoms, his grapefruit-sized aneurysm was at least 12 centimeters in diameter. That's ripe for popping. Now, until a few years ago, the operation of choice would be to reset or cut out the diseased aneurysmal segment, but this has been quickly replaced by prosthetic grafts. But even more recently, we've developed even less invasive options such as endovascular grafts. These endovascular grafts are inserted via the femoral artery in your groin, positioned within the aneurysm, and then secured with self-expanding stents or even hooks. Obviously, you can see that surgeons nowadays have a huge variety of options, but in 1948, cling film was all it took. After this incredible bit of handiwork, Einstein just spent three weeks recovering in hospital before he was discharged back home to Princeton, New Jersey. Now, it must be said that this operation was a palliative one, which means it wasn't curative. The aneurysm was still there and inevitably it was going to pop, but it was a life prolonging one. Einstein actually lived five more productive years with minimal symptoms. And in 1952, he was offered and then rejected the presidency of Israel. 
1954, he published his last scientific journal in the Annals of Mathematics. I mean, during this time, he still did have niggling pain. He had back pain and severe right upper quadrant pain under his ribs, which was diagnosed as chronic cholecystitis, an inflammation of the gallbladder. Although for these episodes of pain, he did freely consume morphine for pain relief, he did have pain-free intervals as well. However, on Tuesday, the 12th of April, 1955, Einstein experienced severe abdominal pain, which only got worse the next day. In the afternoon of the 13th of April, Einstein collapsed. It was likely at this point the aneurysm had ruptured and was oozing into his retroperitoneum. Although Einstein must have realized his aneurysm had popped, he initially refused hospitalization. However, he finally agreed to be admitted to Princeton Hospital, but only because he felt he was becoming a nuisance and a burden at home. Four specialists were summoned and consulted to see if surgery should be attempted, but Einstein would have none of it. He refused all forms of treatment. On the 15th of April, he was brought to Princeton Hospital where he patiently expected his death. When Einstein refused surgery, he actually said, I want to go when I want. It is tasteless to prolong life artificially. I've done my share. It is time to go and I will do it elegantly. On the 18th of April, shortly before midnight, the night nurse who was checking up on Albert Einstein noticed that his breathing pattern had changed. His breathing was slightly more labored. This is known as the death rattle. He mumbled a few last words in his German mother tongue, which the nurse didn't understand. And five days after admission, at 1.15 a.m., April 18th, 1955, Albert Einstein expired. An autopsy or post-mortem conducted by Thomas Harvey, a pathologist, revealed that his gallbladder was normal, but he had a huge ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Harvey reported that the hemorrhage from his aneurysm had compressed the gallbladder, causing the attack of cholecystitis. Einstein never quite obeyed his doctors, who urged him on multiple occasions to quit smoking for his own health. Smoking is a major risk factor for aortic aneurysms, resulting in a 7.6-fold increased risk. And studies have shown that 80% of the people who develop aortic aneurysms are smokers. By all reports, Albert Einstein did die peacefully and according to his last will, his body was cremated and his ashes scattered except his brain. Now, what actually happened to Einstein's brain? Well, the most famous brain in the world disappeared mysteriously after his autopsy and was later discovered to have secretly been stolen and hidden by Thomas Harvey, the pathologist who did the post-mortem. But 40 years later, Thomas Harvey at the age of 86, along with the journalist, drove Einstein's brain across the United States on a road trip to eventually give to Einstein's granddaughter. What a gift. In many countries who have surveillance and screening programs for aneurysms, men over the age of 65 are often screened using an abdominal ultrasound to check for abdominal aneurysm. And sometimes even younger if they're smokers or have a strong family history of aneurysms. Remember, early detection saves lives.